Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you're enjoying your afternoon here uh, in the basement. <laughs> it's kind of chill down here. It's a nice little nap. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a co founder and CTO of Dremio um, and uh, also very active in a number of Apache communities, including Apache Arrow and Apache CalSite. Um, I got a lot of talk here, so hopefully we'll go through pretty quick and you guys get something valuable out of it. Um, I'm going to start by talking, spending a few slides talking about Apache Arrow. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about Dremio and how Dremio uses Arrow to do things. Then I'm going to give you some examples of uh, notebooks and how to access different types of data. Um, then I'm going to go into some of the stuff we do, which we call reflections, which is a form of caching, um, and how that can improve, improve things, and show you some examples of what that impact looks like. So, uh, sort of at the top, um, sort of why why I uh, started a company and what we were thinking about was this is like getting data ready for analysis is too hard. Um, and this is true whether you're an analyst or a data scientist or a product manager who just needs to find some data to solve a question. Um, it's like hard to find the data. Many of the data systems that are very great for developers and have massive scale um, are not necessarily built for analysis purposes. Sometimes it's very hard to get to the data. The interfaces are not necessarily the standard ones that we all love. Um, data is never in a single system anymore. So I think there was this sort of beautiful idea a few years ago that data lakes were going to solve all of our data distribution problems and everything was going to be on one data lake. Um, but the reality is, is that that never happened, or at least it happens very, very rarely. Um, and so usually you have to deal with data in many, many different systems. And some of those systems can be very sort of old school, like filers with CSVs, as someone was just mentioning to me. Um, uh, and then there's you know, new stuff where it's like, hey, what's the newest NoSQL database that might be out there? Um, data access is frequently slow, so these systems are frequently optimized for LTP purposes, not for analytical purposes, and that can be a challenge as well. Um, and so what happens is, is that we see a lot is people have to open tickets to people who are more technical to get access to data than they would like. And so I have to go to central IT and I have to open a ticket and say, hey, this is how I need to get to this data. Um, and there's also this issue where when I ask for the data, I don't know exactly what the right answer is. So then I'll get some data and then I'll realize that there's some problems with the data and I'll need to go back to central IT and ask for more questions. And so really what we said is, hey, there needs to be, we need to improve this process. Right? There's going to be a need for every part of the data pipeline as there is today. So central IT, data engineering, um, sort of data cleansing at different levels. All that stuff needs to exist, but isn't there a sort of simplified way to do this, a way that's more self-service? Um, and so what we did is we started out with sort of a very base problem, which is, is when we're thinking about data, so if you think about sort of data infrastructure today, it's kind of what I would call a loosely coupled ecosystem. Um, there are lots of different tools that are good for certain sort of use cases, and you really want to approach data with a best of breed approach. Um, the problem is, is that moving data between different systems can be very, very expensive. And so before we even built up a product at Dremio, we actually started up a project called Apache Arrow. Um, many of you have probably heard of Apache Arrow. Um, its goal is pretty simple, which is, is that we want to have a canonical representation of data in memory so that we can speed both inter interchange between different systems and processing of data in general. Um, and so uh, there's a huge amount of opportunities there. So Arrow is a columnar in memory format focused on not only simple data, but all sorts of complex data patterns that we see in real world data. Um, and it's a Apache foundation project, which means that it's consensus driven. We have 13 or 14 uh, different uh, open, contributors from 13 or 14 different open source projects at least, I think it's more now, um, that are contributing to Apache Arrow. So it's something that's uh, not owned by any one company, it's designed to be a collaborative approach to how to solve this problem. And really there's just kind of a chicken and an egg thing going on with Arrow. So we, we were looking at the world and we're saying, hey, how do we make it so that a loosely coupled ecosystem, we don't spend all of our time in deserialization. So there's lots of analysis out there that's been done, some of it around the Arrow stuff, um, and a bunch of other people have done it too, where if you actually look at data pipelines, if you start to move between different systems, you might spend somewhere between 80 and 90% of your resources against the serialization and deserialization of moving between those systems. And there's kind of two reasons to that. One is, is that each system has its own internal representation of data. Um, and so when you want to move from one system to another, you have to take the internal representation, expose that as some kind of API, and then the other side of the system, the other system is going to interact with that API and turn it into its internal representation. And there's two problems there. One is, is that all this conversions. The other is, is that generally speaking, the, the interface between the two is an API. And that means usually you're going to have a cell-by-cell -cell access of that data to move it from one format to the other format. So that's just a lot of processing overhead as well. And so Arrow said, hey, well, how do we solve this? Well, we solve this by trying to get it so that more people use the same representation of data when they're processing it. Now, convincing someone to change their internal representation inside of a system is very difficult. 
right? So that's a long, it's going to be a long process to get people to sort of adopt it. But one of the things that we saw as key to that is, is that the representation needs to be highly efficient for processing. The reason you have a different internal representation versus an external representation is because you need internal representation that's fast for processing. If a common format that you can pass between different systems uh, is very efficient for passing between systems but isn't fast for processing, well then each system is going to come up with their own internal representation and they're going to spend a lot of time moving between those two. And so we actually looked at it and solved first for the processing use case and said, how do you represent data in an efficient manner so that you can process it well with modern CPUs? And that basically led us to the representation we had where we line things up in a columnar format. We have a bunch of different things that we do around that to make it uh, efficient. Um, and we have sort of patterns of how we do shredded representations for complex data and a bunch of other things. And so that, so the, which, which one's the chicken and the egg, I don't know, but basically solve for processing performance um, and people will start to adopt it for processing performances and they can also adopt it for interchange because now all of a sudden other systems are communicating it. Um, so that's really what Arrow is about. There are three main components to Arrow. Um, and just to keep in mind, Arrow is a fairly low level technology. It's designed to be used by people who are building tools so that people who are using tools can have much better performance. Um, so the three components, I, I sort of, as I think about it, are a core set of libraries, uh, some of what I call building blocks, and then some in example integrations of Arrow. So for core libraries, basically we're adding languages all the time so that you can interact with Arrow no matter what language you're in, right? And so one of the most common patterns that people are starting to use Arrow from, for are movement between JVM-based stuff and non-JVM-based stuff. So I've got a Python or a C++ application, and unfortunately, a bunch of my stuff is inside of some big data technology which runs the JVM, and the JVM is not very good at playing with others. And so you can use Arrow to represent that data inside of the JVM, and then you can simply connect that memory down to the, the other application without any extra overhead. Um, so that's the core set of libraries. Um, at sort of the top of the list here are sort of the more mature ones down at the bottom, JavaScript, Rust, those are things that are kind of happening more recently, but people are already using them in a lot of products and at, at, at production. On top of that, uh, I'm basically talking about some sort of building blocks that we're building inside of the Arrow community. So two examples are Plasma and Feather. So Plasma is a shared memory caching layer that can be used, um, originally created inside the Brave project. Um, and then you also have Feather, which is a fast ephemeral form data format for writing data quickly that's in an Arrow representation. So it might be that like I don't, I, I, I'm moving between two processes, I don't know how, I haven't solved yet shared memory between those two processes, but what I can do is I can write the feather file quickly to disk, have the other process open up the feather file, pull it back into memory, and it's very, very efficient. Um, two additional projects that we're working on, one is called Arrow RPC, which is a standard way for different systems to communicate with each other using Arrow as a representation, and this is going to be both a single and a parallel stream interface. So one of the things that happens is that you may have uh, what is an Arrow data set, um, and you want to pass that to another system very efficiently, but those are both distributed systems, so that Arrow, the Arrow RPC will also support a parallel read interface. Um, the last piece that we're working on is something called the Arrow kernels. And this is really sort of driving another way for people to understand and start to take advantage of Arrow. And so imagine you have a situation today where you're trying to figure out how to come up quickly, come up to, with a dictionary as efficiently as possible using modern CPUs, or you're trying to sort data very, very quickly. Um, and so what Arrow kernels are, are these small processing library, uh, processing tasks that you can apply to an Arrow representation to, as quickly as possible, turn it into the new Arrow representation. And so if you're trying to solve for a system that has one of these needs, you can pick up one of these kernels, and if you get the data into Arrow representation, all of a sudden you can do these operations very, very quickly. And so for some of you that have listened to the Weld talk, right, one of the things that we would love to look at is, is, is combining, uh, having Weld consume and produce Arrow so that it has a, it's another way of sort of, you can think of that as an advanced Arrow kernel um, running out sort of outside the Arrow project. Um, that's kind of what Arrow kernels are. They're little things that can process certain things um, so that you can start to take advantage of the Arrow representation as possible. Uh, and then lastly, Arrow integration. So there are several of these. Um, two of the big ones is Pandas is using it as a primary internal representation for many things now. Um, and Spark has uh, adopted that as a way to move back and forth between um, Python and uh, Spark uh, representation. Um, and so there's two there. Um, Parquet and Arrow are very sort of uh, closely related, um, started by some of the same people. Um, and so um, the Parquet is sort of what I think of as the canonical on disk representation of data, and the arrow is trying to become the canonical memory representation of data. Um, and so we have a bunch of integrations to make it very fast to move between one and the other. Um, the GPU Open Analytics Initiative um, is driving the GPU data frame, um, libgdf, um, and using arrow as the representation to do that. 
And then lastly, the thing I'm going to talk about today, Dremio is an open source project, uh, Apache licensed, um, that also uses Arrow as their entire representation for data throughout our processing pipeline. So Arrow, uh, Arrow started less than two years ago, I think, something like that. Um, a uh, huge amount of adoption, very happy with the progress on it. Um, still a long ways to go to make it actually be in every single tool that you're using today. Um, but uh, I think we hit at the end of, this is a partial chart here, but I think at the end of the year last year, we had over 100,000 downloads a month for Arrow. So Arrow is the base. It's like, how do we start to deal with data in a sort of more common way? And then on top of that, we said, hey, how do we make it so that it's more easy to get access to data? And that's what Dremio is about. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Dremio is an Apache licensed project. It's built on top of, I'm talking about the right-hand side here first, I guess. Um, built on top of Apache Arrow, Apache CalSight, and Apache um, Parquet. Um, it's really designed to make it easier to access your data. Um, it's done by the company uh, that I work at. Um, we launched the product last July, so it's a fairly new product. It's been out less than a year. Um, and we really call it a self-service data access platform or data platform. Um, and then lastly, if there's a question, uh, the Narwhal, who's our logo, is in Narnia. <laughs> Which is one of those situations where someone suggested it as a jest, and then it's fine. So, what, do you, what is Dromeo specifically? Um, and I'll, give you, I'll give you a demo in just a second, so there's only a couple slides here. But um, uh, Dromeo, we think of it as Google Docs for your data, as a way to collaborate around um, data access and data endpoints, data assets, um, where people are less focused on the mechanical side of data. So, the goal is, is that um, we really separate out the concept of logical data versus physical data. So physical data should be dealt with because of like choices around performance or security and those kinds of things. Logical data should be the thing that most users interact with, and you should be able to separate those two things out. And that's what Dremio is really about. And so the core of that is, is a UI to access the different data, excuse me, um, as well as data curation. So being able to manipulate data without having to always open up tickets and get other people to help support you. Um, we actually break the sort of pieces of what we're trying to provide here into four main components. Uh, on the right hand side, data catalog and data curation. So I gotta find asset, my data assets wherever they are, um, and I need to be able to manipulate them without having to open tickets all the time. Um, but also on top of that is data caching. So if lots of people are accessing the same data regularly, well then there's a benefit to maybe maintaining alternative physical representations of that data to make access faster independent of the specific logical way that people are looking at it. Um, and then lastly, well, I've got to actually access the data itself. So I've got to talk to different systems. And so Dremio has a bunch of different sources that it can interact with as owners of the systems. So one of the things that we think about is, is that this self-service data access layer is about uh, providing sort of a common inter interface for data, uh, but not only data. So uh, we don't argue that Dremio, Dremio is not a system of record, so you use your existing systems of records, which are probably many, um, but simply use Dremio as an easier way to get sort of a common interface into those systems, into the data. So without uh, further ado, I will switch over and hopefully show you a little demo here. So um, the demo guys are kind, of course. Um, so let me, uh, so, so quickly here, this is the Dremio homepage. Um, I'm logged in as myself here. Um, and you start out in your, uh, your, your home space where you can have sort of different projects that you're working on. So you can, and so in Dremio, the objects that we're dealing with are basically always data sets. They're, they're, they're data that you're gonna interact with for one purpose or another. Um, and then you have different sources. So as I mentioned, Dremio has a bunch of different sources that you can access here, some of them here. Um, basically think about uh, sort of Relational mixed with a bunch of sort of more most common sort of NoSQLs, data lakes, that kind of thing. Um, and so for each of these things, we want to make those as, look as similar as possible. And so for example here, I've actually got six or so sources connected to Dremio at this moment. We've actually named these for demo purposes based on what the systems are. But the reality is, is that they actually could be named in a misleading way. It wouldn't matter. And realistically, the most way our customers use it is they actually name them based on business concepts. So maybe it's the marketing database and the customer retention database and something else here, right? Um, the individual systems really are abstracted away. And so for example, we actually have the same data in Mongo and Elasticsearch here. And so uh, we've got some of this Yelp data set that people like to use as demo data sets. So I've got it over here at Mongo. And so we map Mongo databases to Dremio folders. We map Mongo collections to Dremio tables or data sets. Um, in Elasticsearch, um, we actually have indexes here and aliases. And those get, and then the individual types inside of those things get mapped to data sets. So we try to abstract this away. And so uh, if you're looking at something like uh, 
new cluster um, or some kind of other data lake, then what can happen is, is that we have folders here, which is just me traversing the data set. I'm actually going to remove the, data, the, the format here. So when, what happens is when you first come into this stuff, you actually see uh, you actually see little folders like this. So this is just more folders. Let me see here. See if my system's up. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so this is just a folder with a bunch of text files. Um, this one over here, another folder with a bunch of text files. And so what Dromio allows you to do is say, okay, well, I want to convert this set of text files. It's going to Dromio is going to do its best. I, I've zoomed in here a little too much. Uh, it looks like we're using the wrong field delimiter, so I'm going to fix the field delimiter here. Okay, that looks good. And then we can get down there. Um, that's now a data set inside of Dromio. And so the idea is, is that whatever data set you're looking at, you always have a basic standard canonical names uh, sort of path to that data set. So this is a data set called hdfs.datas.loans.acquisition. And so that can be used in any kind of context inside of Dremio as a data set now. And a user doesn't have to know whether or not that's a physical representation of a data set or a logical representation of a data set. They can just sort of interact with it as an endpoint. And they may only have access to some portions of those things, right? Um, and so, uh, let's go, so let's go back. Let's go up here. Um, so that's, that's kind of very quickly how Dremio works. So thinking about it from uh, a notebook perspective, uh, let's just sort of go through here. I have a little notebook here with some access. Hopefully that's big enough for people to see back there. I've got a little setup. At the moment, we're connecting to the Dremio using ODBC. Um, what we're working on, as I mentioned, is Arrow RPC, and that will be the primary interface that we use moving forward. Um, but that's not complete yet, and so that's why we're using ODBC as sort of a more standard thing. You use REST or JDBC or whatever if you're in different kinds of situations. Anyway, so. Uh, so I'm going to say define some utility methods here, and then basically in Dremio, everything is a schema, um, and so uh, ODBC happens to expose things as two levels, um, but we, as I showed you with that path before, can have an arbitrary number of levels, and so we'll flatten those out into schema name as basically all of the things except the leaf thing, uh, and then we can go into one of those things. So in this example, I'm going to go in and use the Mongo dataset, uh, the Mongo.yelp dataset, and move in there, and then you can see all the tables that are available inside the system. And so let's start interacting with the data. And so what I'll do is I'm actually going to run a query here against this to get some data. So one of the first things that Dremio does is, is that Dremio uh, sees complex data. So if you're looking at MongoDB, for example, the data can be complex and it can also be arbitrarily schema right? And so what Dremio will do is it'll sample the schema, um, expose that to the user, and then as we read more and more data from the system, we will actually identify new schemas. And so, for example, the first record in, inside of a Mongo table could be, uh, one of the columns could be an integer, and the second record, that same column, could be a struct with some list inside of it, right? There's, an art, it's, there's no rules around this stuff. And so Dremio actually supports that, exposes tools for you to sort of deal with those, what we call heterogeneous types, um, and it also constantly samples and learns from those samples so that the user can interact with the stuff, even if the stuff is kind of a mess, okay? So if you go back to how you expose this stuff to other tools, well, what we do is that because OEBC doesn't have a great interface for complex data, what we do is something very simple. Is anything that's complex or doesn't fit into sort of standard uh, traditional relational schema stuff, we actually convert it always to JSON. Even if the underlying representation happens to be something completely different, um, the data coming back will always be JSON when it's a complex type. And so what I can do inside of Python is I can just use a standard Python tool. So here, for example, I'm zoomed in too much here, but there's an hours column, so there's a categories column, which is just an array, and then there's an hours column, which is a, as a map, um, and the map has some different hours inside of it. And so what we can do is, is that, um, let me get it a little too big here, because it's very hard to see everything. Um, but basically, we're going to look at one of these things and grab the hours field. Okay, now that's come back as a JSON representation, which I've parsed using uh, Python tools, and I can grab out of that the certain value for what time the, if the restaurant closes Friday, for example. So that's, that's what you can do. So if you use the tools that you already have, you can just say, hey, let me get some records back and start playing with them. You can also use Dremio if you want to expose this stuff more commonly or want to build a pattern around it. And so here, I'm actually going to ask for the exact same value, which is um, hours.friday.close, and go to the next Dremio to get that for me, and then Dremio will return it for me. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to define new data endpoints inside of Dremio um, that expose certain fields. And so a user may not, uh, not all users may understand complex data types, but you want to expose it to another user. You can create a data endpoint which exposes it in this flattened way inside of Dremio as a virtual data set, and then they can interact with that. So to sort of give you a better example of sort of curating the data, I'm going to go into here, look at Mongo Yelp. I'm going to look at the businesses inside of Mongo Yelp. This is the data we were just looking at before. As I mentioned, there's a categories column here, which is an array of things. And so if I'm a user trying to analyze this stuff, 
maybe one of the first things I want to do is I want to clean it up. I mean, maybe I want to do two things with it. So what I'm going to do is I just clicked in here. I'm in Business Mongo Yelp. So right now this is purple, which means the physical data set. Um, but I actually want to save it as a virtual data set inside of my access space as my business. Okay. So now, all of a sudden, now this is an endpoint that I can share with other people. And I can choose to change the data set in many ways based on whatever I think is important. So for example, maybe I want to collapse uh, these things out of arrays because I know the user I'm interacting with is not going to be able to deal with arrays. So now I flatten this down into nine arrays and I'm going to rename this into a different column. And then over here I'm going to go, okay, I think that I actually want to extract the zip code because there's no field for zip code. So it's going to suggest some different things. I'm going to say that this one's good enough, even though my sample doesn't look that good. But we try to basically look at different patterns and see which one works the best and then propose that as a pattern. So here I've got a zip code column. I can now save that. This is now an endpoint that I can use. So I can go back over here um, and put that in here. I got name it something I just did. And now as a user, I can start interacting with Access My Business and expose that to other users. And they have no idea. Like, We've already forgotten that. I remember now, this is Mongo. This is a Mongo table. But the user doesn't have to know about that. We've manipulated it and we've done it virtually. So there's no need for us to make a copy of the data um, and start passing that around. And if you want to, you can go into the product then and understand where something comes from. So this example, if actually you see that here's the My Business virtual data that's been defined. Here's the physical representation of that, which happens to be coming from a Mongo database. So you can go and look at these different virtual data sets, build them on top of each other, and share those with different people. And so different levels of technical expertise can do different levels of, of data lifting, right? So someone who doesn't have much sophistication might work with things that are more curated, um, but someone who's more of a power user might be able to go to more to raw sources and interact with that data directly, depending on where it's from. Um, so anyway, so that's there. And at the same time, what we constantly see with users, and this is something we actually didn't originally plan, but then we saw a bunch of users who were actually having this pattern, which is, is that frequently you've got a bunch of big data system stuff, but then you've also got some stuff that's sort of personal to you. And so for example, you might be trying to understand what's going on with a certain set of customers. And so you've got a customer list in Excel that's the 45 customers that you want to interact with. And you need to combine that with the other data to try to figure out the set of information that you're looking at. And so Joby will also allow you to actually um, upload data and import that and then expose that as additional uh, data uh, endpoints. Let's see if I can get the right scroll bar here. Uh, so I save that. And so now this is available as an endpoint just like anything else. And so uh, now that is not currently available to anybody else because uh, it's in MySpace. So home spaces are private. Um, but if I want to save that as a virtual data set in a public space, then I can make that data available to other people. So it's something that's only available, and there's my Excel spreadsheet now for analysis. So that's about just basic access. Now, thinking about access, that's great that I can expose some data from different systems. But what we've experienced is, is that uh, you want to leverage the underlying systems as much as possible. Because with trivial amounts of data, it's fine for you. So you can pull the data back into Dremio, and Dremio starts doing processing. But when you're talking about big data systems, it's very frequently the case that you want to actually do as much work in the underlying system as possible. An example is Elasticsearch, right? Elasticsearch is great at using its index to get the data very quickly, filtering down to certain sets of records. But if you actually ask Elasticsearch to return large amounts of records to you, its row speed is extremely slow. Um, it, can't, it can return something like 50 or 100,000 records per second per thread or something like that, something very small compared to some of the other representations. And so you want to leverage these systems as much as possible. And so here's an example where we're going to actually, so what we did inside of Dremio is we tried to expose these systems as much as possible. And so in some cases, there are systems that have specialized capabilities. An example of that is Elasticsearch, where we said, hey, Elasticsearch has the ability to do all sorts of arbitrary, unstructured searches. And so how do we expose that in Dremio? And we said, well, we're trying to model this around SQL, so let's expose it as a contains clause. So if you actually look at MySQL or Oracle, all these different systems, they have something called contains, which is a way of using the full, in, uh, the full text indexing to find things. And so we actually expose that inside of Dremio. We expose it using the Lucene syntax. And so in this example, I'm going to go and go look at the reviews. And what I'm going to be looking for are things where we see awkward end date. And this is where you would need to know Lucene syntax to expose this. Um, we try to expose this power. In this example, we're actually doing a proximity search. We're saying we want awkward end date to be within two words of each other. Right? And so if you wanted to do this without something like this tool, it would take you quite a bit of time. Um, but it's something that Elasticsearch is very good at. And so I can hit that, pull this back, I actually pull out the cell, which actually has the text in it. And there I can see, hey, here's the first example of an awkward date I got when I searched from Dremio into Elasticsearch. 
right? So that, just so you know, everything that I've done up until now uh, has been entirely based on what we call in situ analytics, which is interacting with the underlying source. Dermot doesn't hold any of the data. It's simply a pass-through mechanism to get the data back to you. You use a common interface, and then we try to figure out the right way to interact with the underlying system. So in this case, this operation, I think I actually don't have this one as an operation. I have another one. So Elastic's also good at aggregations. And so here I have something where I might want to be saying, hey, let me roll up how many reviews there were uh, organized by stars, um, looking at that by year, right? And so this happens to be something that Elasticsearch is very good at. Just, there you go. Sorry, it popped up right here. Um, and so I just ran that query. That's a query which they have turned into Elasticsearch's internal representation of how to uh, specify queries. In parallel, Dremio interacted with some multiple math elastic search shards, got the answer, turned it back into a table, and returned that as. Okay, so that's the result that we got there. And this is actually the query that we generated and sent in parallel to Elasticsearch, if you're interested. Um, and so this is basically the way that you talk to Elasticsearch. You apply, here we're applying a date range with a certain Elasticsearch time, time stamp format. Um, we're saying whether or not we include the lower and upper bounds, and then we do several layers of aggregations around stars and month, um, and we actually, in this case, push down a Groovy script to do some kind of operation around getting a year. And so what we're trying to do is basically abstract this all this stuff away. It's not that you couldn't write this script to do it, but really we think you should be thinking about more about analyzing data um, and figuring out what you want to do with the data than trying to figure out how each of these systems exposes its data. And so the same is true for the other system, true for the other systems that we interact with. And so here's an example of Mongo pushdown. So here we're going to do another aggregation, which is a count of the stars by review, and we're applying that to Amazing. I think this one takes a little bit longer. Our, uh, our Mongo cluster is a bit slow here. So let's see if we wait and see. So hopefully, then we'll go to kind of us. We'll get a result here in a second. Yeah, so there's, there's the answer. So anyway, we push down stuff again. In this example, I'm actually doing a search for uh, giving me these stars for things that have a, the word Amazing in them. And so this is actually pushing down a rate of expression into Mongo, allowing Mongo to sort of figure out this filter, um, and then doing the aggregation of Mongo as well. So all that time actually is in Mongo. It's Dremio is kind of just passing through in this case. And as we might expect, people who say amazing generally rate the reviews very, very high. Right? There are a lot of one-star reviews that say amazing inside of them. It's not something that's used in negative reviews. And so example is just as before. We come up with what's the right syntax. So this happens to be the syntax that we use to run this operation against the MongoDB. We use the uh, Mongo aggregation pipeline to do this, but again, trying to abstract it away so users don't have to. Now, we also interact with relational databases, and as much as you'd like to think that relational databases are all the same, they're not. Um, and so again, we try to abstract that away so the user doesn't have to be thinking about which relational database am I using and how can I write the queries correctly. And so for example, here, we're running a query against uh, limit one against an Oracle table, and if you might remember, Oracle doesn't do limit one. In fact, you have, it doesn't support limit. You have to use Ronum. And so we are smart enough to figure that out. Here's an example where we're doing something against SQL Server. In this case, we're doing an extractive year, which is a standard SQL context, context, uh, concept, but SQL Server doesn't support it. And actually, SQL Server also doesn't use the same quoting. So all of a sudden, we've got to use brackets, and we've got to use a year function as opposed to the extract syntax of before. So the goal being that no matter what the system is, is, is that Dremio can abstract that away. So you're abstracting away what the complexities of the underlying system are. You're also abstracting away whatever levels of curations you want to do before the users start interacting with things. And then users themselves can manipulate and change these things and then share them with each other if they realize there's a weakness to the underlying data the asset that's sort of a lower level organizational person has provided. So that's about access, okay? So going to the second part, which is about caching, right? And so what we've seen is, is that people often interact with the same data in the same way, okay? And what happens is, is that you build these giant clusters of systems to try to process and deal with data the same way multiple times because there isn't a great way for people to collaborate around these concepts. And so if you think about it, like accessing data is good, right? But what we see is, is that it's often too slow. And that's actually one of the biggest sort of blockers to analysis is, is that you're constantly waiting for results to come back to you or constantly waiting for tickets. You're constantly waiting for something rather than just thinking, thinking sort of in the flow. And so one of the things we say is, is that we want to figure out ways to in decrease the distance to the data. So the first is access, but then it's like how much work needs to be done to actually get my answers, right? So you can think about that in many ways. It's like how much, how much data manipulation happens, needs to happen, how much movement of data between systems needs to happen, how long does that take, take to complete? And so Dremio introduced this concept of reflections. And a reflection is an alternative version of the data 
that is closer to what you want. Okay, um, and it could be closer because it's on a system that's closer to you, like it could be physically closer, it could be closer because it's in a representation that is faster to process, so if the row speed of Elasticsearch is slow and you know you're already around, always interacting with the last 30 days with the data in Elasticsearch, maybe you put that in a representation that's much more efficient. Um, it could be a representation of data that is closer to the question you are asking. So if I've got a very large table and I'm constantly asking it a question around you know, something where I'm doing some level of summarization or aggregation, then possibly we could have a version of the data that's somewhat partially summarized um, that could be closer to your answer. And so that relationship can be fairly complicated in that the data that you might need to answer a question could possibly come from multiple places. Maybe summarization answers part of your question, and so we can use a pre-summarized version of data for some of it, but then you may also want to use the raw data for some other part of your question. Um, and so you want to be able to balance these things. And this is something that everybody does already, which is, is that if you know you have a use case which you can benefit from having an alternative representation of data, people create alternative representations of data all the time. What happens is, is that you then create lots of these representations and you have to rely on the users to figure out what's the right representation to use to get the optimal experience. Okay? And this is where it starts to break down as your organization gets larger and you have larger, a larger number of these data sets that people need to interact with. You also have a problem with change control. Where do these data sets come from? Is this really the data set that I wanted to look at? And so Trivio basically tried to solve that part of the problem too. And so I said everything is separated out between logical and physical. And so when we're talking about reflection and caching, that's all physical, right? So you interact with those data endpoints, you can do whatever you want. But what we want to be able to do is allow users to also, uh, people who sort of understand the systems more, allow them to sort of set different conditions around what can be cached. What are the concepts around data that might be allowed to be a little bit stale, like a day old or an hour old, um, and you make alternative representations. And so what happens is, is that sort of how you do it today is on the left-hand side here, which is, is that you use a copy and fix strategy. You create different copies of data for different versions, different use cases, and then you ask the analyst or data scientist to pick the right representation for their purposes. What Dremio tries to do is say, hey, we may want to create alternative representations, what we call reflections, for different purposes from a physical standpoint, but the user should not have to interact with those or ask for the particular thing that's best for them. And Dremio can actually make that decision for you. So as you're going through an analysis, it may be that you start with one, you may start with, with a particular logical endpoint, and then we recognize that based on the way that you're interacting with that endpoint or that physical data set, we actually realize that an alternative version of that data can be faster, and we swap it in. And so we're constantly looking at every operation that comes in, looking at all the different versions of data that we have, and trying to figure out what's the best one to swap in. And so here's a couple of examples of how this works. There's a lot of different ways that this works, um, but the model is, is basically the same, which is, is that if you imagine on the left-hand side here, this might be an operation that you're trying to do with your data. Um, on the middle here are different reflections or materializations that we have that we're using to try to see whether or not we can make things go faster. And so in this first example, we have something which is an aggregation. So I'm doing, I'm, I'm scanning table one, I'm doing a projection of A and C, I am then doing an aggregation of A, summing C as C prime, and then I'm doing a filter on C prime. Right? And so this might be interacting with raw data that might be billions of records, but someone may have actually printed a reflection R1 that R1 reflection is actually defined as an aggregation of A and B, sum of C. Okay? And so Dremio will look and say, hey, you know what, I have this reflection which matches part of what you want. It's not exactly what you want, but it's part of it. And so I'm actually going to rewrite your query so that it takes advantage of this underlying reflection. And then all of a sudden the query is actually a, is an operation on top of a reflection one with a, an additional roll-up to try to get to the subset of data that you're interested in, and then applies the filter anyway. And so Dremio is constantly trying to look at these opportunities to try to make it so that when you do things, it's going to go faster, but the user didn't realize it. The user doesn't have to worry about it. And so that means that as you see different use cases where you need things to go faster, you can create new reflections, and without changing any of the consumption of those data sets, the, the, the operations go faster. Um, and so here's a couple other examples as well. Um, if you have a join with some aggregations, we can actually figure out different ways to map these things together. And then also, it may be that you're interacting with raw data. Maybe you have a use case where you're trying to do a lot of needle and haystack analyses, right? And so different partitioning or sorting strategies of the raw data, maybe with only a subset of columns, might be better to make your, make your operations go faster. And so Dremio can also have that. So you can have different reflections of the underlying data. Um, partition some by, by, by one field, then partition uh, sort by another. And then Dremio will do costing against each of those, always looking to see what's the fastest path to an answer. So no matter what happens, 
you basically have the user interact with those logical endpoints, and then Dremio tries to figure out the right example. And so, quickly go over here. So here's a quick example of this. I have another setup here. Um, so here's, uh, we have this is a little, this is a little three cluster node inside of Google Compute, uh, and we're gonna count on New York taxi. So this is the taxi trips for like five years worth of data, I think 2010 to 2015 or something like that. It's a billion records, okay? So that operation I just ran, was uh, was interacting with Dromeo. Um, I have no idea whether or not there are reflections against New York taxi got trips. I'm just interacting with that as a data set. Um, so let's look at actually what the raw data set is. I can see here, okay, here's a couple of rows from, from the taxi trips data. Okay, it's got pickup, drop off times, passenger counts, things like that. Okay? So the user feels like they're interacting with the raw data, right? But let's say that they're asking a question um, which we've gotten a partial summarization for. And so in this example, I'm going to look at the number of trips for each year. Okay, it's a very simple example, but uh, it's a big font, so we'll, we'll look at it there. So I'm going to run this, and Dremio is going to go and figure that out. Now, I just ran a query, so it's just sort of to recap here. I just ran an aggregation on a billion records on a three-node cluster in less than a second. The user has no idea that Dremio has a reflection which makes this go faster, and they don't need to know. Right? They interact with the raw data, they can interact with the raw data, and they can take advantage of these things. And so, Dremio just said, hey, you know what, I have another version of that representation of data. It's way closer to your answer. We're not dealing with a billion records right now. We can't be dealing with a billion records right now. And so you can think of reflections kind of like indexes, right? So when you go and search Google, right, it may return, it may search, you know, whatever the trillion documents that it has in its index now, I don't know what the number is. Um, but it doesn't actually search all of those, right? It's got representations of data that are closer to what your question is, so they can come back in some second time. And it's the same with Dremio, and say, hey, let's have some different representations, and as users ask questions, we can figure out what's the best representation to answer this question as quickly as possible. And so, as I mentioned, that may also be working with subsets of data. So this example here, I wanted to interact with something that actually, I want to interact with raw data, right? So if I'm trying to do, build a machine learning model, I might want to say, hey, I want to look at all the trips that happened on the 4th of July. I want to see what the patterns are in New York on the 4th of July. And so here's an example of doing that. And so this is using a different kind of reflection, which allows us to go back and do point queries against the data and as quickly as possible. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm going to wrap up really close, I promise. Um, and so, uh, again, got back very, very quickly. And if I wanted to then load that into a data frame to do a more visual analysis, I'm only pulling 100,000 back here because I don't, I don't know how fast the network is, but uh, here I can pull back, I can pull all back all that raw data and still take advantage of that reflection. So the user is moving back and forth between interacting with the raw data, interacting with different reflections of the data, but they have no idea. And that's the, that's the goal, right, is that they don't need to have an idea. They can simply take advantage of how fast things are and how things look all the same. So I am going to wrap up in like milliseconds. So I'll send out the slides. There's some points here. Um, if you want to ask questions, feel free to come to me. I'm going to office hours directly after this. Um, go download the product. Go check it out. Play with it. Let us know what you think of it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You are in maybe best position to make the right decisions or calls. Question. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think that um, the, the short answer I would say is, is that we don't believe that this solves every data engineering problem. We're not even close to that. Our goal is to solve some small portion of data engineering problems that are closer to consumers, um, but we believe that it fits within uh, like a range of tools um, that are beyond this. And so we actually have a number of concepts that we actually, for example, we just introduced a new concept of external reflections where you can use any data engineering tool you want to produce alternative representations and simply inform them of what they are and still expose that logical view. So we're trying to figure out ways that you can use whatever tool you want. So if you want to bust out of the, the, the abstraction um, because you want to do something super fancy, you can do that. One more question. Uh, yeah. As an end user, can I control uh, how long would the um, data reflection be cached? What if I, uh, the data is mutable and uh, can I control um, the cache data? Yeah, so, so in terms of uh, controls, you actually control it around the data set. So every data set has policies around how it can be updated and how uh, stale data is allowed to be before we actually refresh them. So Dremio guarantees that you always maintain the SLA that is that uh, is set for each data set you're interacting with. So you can set some SLAs to say, hey, I don't want to do any reflections here. You can set other data sets, maybe a data set that's not changing very much, you set that in a day, and then maybe a data set that's changing very frequently, you might set to five minutes. 
Um, so you can control the SLA on a per data set level and also control how we do updates. Do we do partial updates? Do we do full updates? Um, uh, and sort of manage those things.